world today that is changing at lightning speed. Even before you've adapted to the previous version of the app, a new one is ready to download. You know what else has changed in the last 30 years? Diet advice. Notice that in the 1990s, fat was the main villain. So I saw people all around me switching from their full fat milk from their doodwala to like skim tetra pack milk and ghee on the roti was out. In the next decade, carbs became the villain. Now ghee was validated by the West as clarified butter so that was okay but rice and roti were out. In the current times, all the noise is about eating in lesser or shorter time restricted windows. So now I see people skipping entire meals and surviving the entire day on black coffee and an extra cigarette. Has this kind of advice, diet advice, made us fitter as a population? WHO released data earlier this year that as of 2022, adult obesity rates have doubled since 1990 and adolescent obesity rates have quadrupled. For the first time ever, our globe is fatter than thinner as obesity prevalence overtakes malnourishment or underweight prevalence in two thirds of the countries across the world. On the other hand, weight loss industry is a 150 billion US dollar industry. We all have access to more diet advice, products, methods, to stay fit than probably our parents or even grandparents had. Yet, we seem to be more confused than ever about our diet choices. See that happening around you? So what do we do about it? One of the main things, you know, when it comes to our health and the health of the planet, because it goes hand in hand, is to go back to your basics and reconnect with your roots. The first step in this direction is to move away from nutrient-based guidelines. Nutrient-based guidelines are a version of nutritionism. You've heard of like racism, sexism, ageism. Really bad, right? Nutritionism is just as bad. It was coined by Michael Pollan. It means judging a food solely based on the value of a single nutrient. So when you're ditching rice for carbs or because you're not eating the homemade laddu because it's too much sugar, not eating ghee because it's too much fat, all of these are examples of nutritionism. Nutrient-based guidelines work very well to do three things. A, they create and monetize your fear of food. B, they keep the food industry in business because now they can sell you the same low fat version of the same product but at a higher price markup. And C, they ensure that you stay perpetually confused about the food choices you should be making. The shift towards food based guidelines is already reflected in the latest dietary guidelines from US, Canada, Brazil. You know where they're talking more about cooking at home and eating according to your cultural practices, eating within your economic means, and limiting processed foods. They are not talking about breaking down food into carbs, protein, fat, calories. They are looking at food as a whole. Nutrition science is slowly but surely catching up with what our grandmothers have told us all along. Eat what is in season and eat what grows around you. So how do we adopt this food-based approach into our daily life? The next time you think about food, put it through the three C test. The first C is cuisine. Is it a part of your traditional cuisine? Does it grow around you? Does your grandmother recognize it? Does she, did she eat it when she was growing up? Because you know, oats today your grandmother might recognize, but she's not eaten it growing up, so it doesn't make the list. The second C is climate. Eating foods that are in season allows us to assimilate a diverse set of micronutrients that 
not only helps us keep the seasonal infections at bay, but also keeps us healthy in the long term. So eat your mango in the summers, the arul bhaji or that kolokesha leaves in the monsoon, and eat your laddu, pinni, halwa in the winters. The third C is culture. Does this food have a name in your local language? And does it have a representation in the songs, the stories, the sayings that are a part of our culture? For example, rice. It has a name in every regional language. Bhat, chokha, chawal, many more, right? It's the first grain we are fed as children when we are weaned off our, brother, our mother's milk. It's also the last grain you, we have. You know when we are dead and we come back as crows, that last meal also has rice. So guys, rice is definitely nice. You know another great thing about native foods, they always bring people together. And they look after marginalized communities. So for example, the Rushinchi Bhaji. Literally translated, it's a bhaji of the saints or sabzi of the saints. It's an elaborate preparation with like wild and uncultivated vegetables you find in the forest. Not only does it bring people together, it keeps the bearers of this tradition in good health. It looks after the smaller communities that know the fine art of foraging and procuring the wild and uncultivated veggies. So not only when you eat local, you're looking after yourself, you're looking out for the community as a whole. And now when we zoom in, you know, from people, public, planet, into our students, we see similar food confusions playing out. And two main challenges regarding food that our students face today is consumption of ultra-processed foods. And B, attaching poor prestige to homegrown food wisdom. You know, when I was growing up in my school, the canteen menu was vada pav, samosa, ice lolly. That's it. Of course, I went to an SSC school, so nothing fancy, but it was still more elaborate than what my parents had access to. You know, which was like a local vendor selling dried amla or gooseberry or like dried kerry or like raw mango outside the school. And today when I revisit school, that same canteen is inundated with chips, colas, wafers, biscuits, ready to eat items, juice boxes, you name it. My heart breaks. Next time when you're around one of these ultra-processed foods, turn the packet around. What you will see is a combination of names and numbers that look nothing like food. These are additives, flavoring agents, emulsifiers that are added to the processing of the food. Simply put, what it means is, even though the juice box has a picture of a natural fruit like mango on the front, the ingredients are nothing close to what you would be putting in a homemade mango juice. These designer molecules make ultra-processed foods addictive, just like tobacco and alcohol. And just like tobacco and alcohol, they must be regulated. There is documented evidence to show that regular consumption of ultra-processed foods leads to obesity, gut issues, mental health issues, hormonal issues, all of which our current student population is dealing with. My second problem, and this is a compounding one, is that not only are we eating lesser and lesser at home, we associate poor prestige with homegrown food wisdom. And we rely on Western diets and Western guidelines to look cool, or aspirational. <coughs> Nutrition transition is a term that was coined by Barry Popkins way back in 1993. It's a phenomenon where countries, uh, where people of developing countries shift from their traditional diets to more westernized ones, you know. Essentially, they're eating more processed and packaged, which has an adverse effect on their health. 
you will see this transition happening all around you. Today, when we pass an exam, we are no longer distributing laddu. It's replaced by a box of chocolate. When we celebrate our birthdays, we are ditching the regional delicacies like biryani, puri bhaji, and we are doing it at fast food joints. And even if we are into home cooking, we are disregarding our grandmother's heritage recipe and following celebrity chefs online. Put all of this together and what you will see is we are spending way too much time in the bathroom than we'd like to, our periods are not as smooth as we'd like them to be, our mental health is not as nice as we'd like it to be, and our stomach is not as flat as we'd like it to be. So today I'm going to share five daily habits we can all adopt so that we stay fit and healthy, not only during college, but even after. So tip number one, <clears throat> start your day with a fresh fruit or a handful of nuts. Any fruit will do, like a banana or a mango when it's in season, any local fruit is good. Nuts like cashews, almonds, walnuts, all of them are good. Have this within the first 10 to 15 minutes of waking up. And after this, don't forget to have your hot breakfast before leaving from home or after, leave, after reaching college. Tip number two, stock up on homemade laddu, matri, chivada, chakli, all of these things. Especially, you know, since if you're living in a hostel, these are great to stock up on. Have them in between classes or during that 4 to 6 p.m. time. You know, naturally you feel like junking at that time. So have one of these options there. So it will also prevent you from going for ultra processed foods that we just spoke about. It not only keeps the acidity down, it will over a period of time also keep your cravings down. Tip number three, include a homemade pickle or a chutney in at least one meal in the day. So everyone from outside can store this in their room. People who are living here, of course, have access to this. Each family has a unique way of making pickles and chutneys. They're a storehouse of nutrients and they help us keep our immunity good and our digestion good. You know, for all of you who feel a dip in energy levels post a meal or you all feel like that chotu bit of chocolate post a meal, you include a homemade pickle or a chutney in the meal and you will surely see the difference. Tip number four, replace one of your chai or coffee with a local sharbat. See, now we're all on the screen all the time. We're studying, we're on the screen. Working, we're on the screen. If we are unwinding for entertainment also, we are on the screen. Being on the screen makes you feel dull, drained, lethargic. And then eventually you're reaching out for chai, coffee, and worse, an energy drink. So at that time, you choose a local sharbat, like Nimbu sharbat, Kokam sharbat, your bale sharbat, coconut water, fresh sugarcane juice, all of this will do. It will not only keep you hydrated, but it will also increase your energy levels throughout the day. Tip number five. Rice is nice, but it's better when it's, you have it for dinner. It's rich in B6, it's a de-stressor, allows you to sleep better and wake up with a flatter stomach. Eat it in the traditional combinations like dal rice, kadi rice, curd rice, and you're good to go. Those were my five tips. You may have seen by now that health is multifactorial. So when you're pursuing health and fitness, don't make it about a number on the weighing scale. Don't make it about a single nutrient like carbs or sugar. Don't make it about deprivation. Good health is commonsensical. Eat local, eat what is in season, sleep on time, exercise regularly, make time for your friends and family, pursue what you want with all your heart, and vote for governments that prioritize walkable cities and clean air. Because truly, no one is healthy till all of us are.